We beseech in the Lord and we seek His blessings to grant us the supreme truth. and make our lives fulfilled. Our salutations to the entire Guru Parampara and we invoke their blessings. So, Today on the 19th of April 2020, a Sunday, Discourse 12, Sharvari Nama Samvatsara Uttarayana Vasantarutu Chaitra Masa Krishna Paksha and Dwadashi, which means we are on the 12th day from the new moon, just three days before the full moon. A warm welcome to all of you again. Okay. So now, I think we are well prepared with the knowledge of the pure being, the supreme being, God, the self, what we call, after we, in detail yesterday and day before, we got to know what is the nature of this Satchit Ananda. See, commonly what comes to our mind is when we say God, we have seen God in different forms. So, prima facie, we try to understand that, okay, God is somebody like this who has so many hands, so many heads, and this is the color. So, that way, we go by the physical attributes. Well, God can take any form. But what is it in its originality, we got to know yesterday. That that existence aspect, which goes to the minutest form, and there we see that God particle playing around in the entire universe. Same way, we could see that in the consciousness. Now, everybody is conscious, right? Whomever we know, they are all conscious here. But can you see the consciousness of another person or feel the consciousness of another person? You only know that. That yes, he is conscious. Because he, he or she is breathing, he or she is alive, so you know they are conscious. But when it comes to understanding, it is only you alone can experience the consciousness within yourself. So go back to that principle of the ten friends who crossed the river. You could see all the other nine. The tenth person could see all the other nine. But he could not see himself. So we, by our millions and millions of births, we have been only known to see, understand, experience the outer world in terms of objects, beings, things, persons. So whatever is able to see, whatever is able to experience, that faculty within you which has kept a person alive, ticking. So that is that consciousness which is of the nature of the true self. So now, having got to know this, now we move forward in terms of here, Lord Sri Krishna, where are we now on the uh, battlefield? We are where Arjuna has surrendered. And Lord Krishna starts with a bang. He says, I am going to give you the highest knowledge now. He could have started with talking about dharma, righteousness. Hey Arjuna, this is, you should not do this. 
practically speaking worldly speaking by common sense no 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 he didn't say all that he straight goes to the atma gnana and then he modulates to worldly gnana the law of righteousness and and uh, various other manners so up to the verse of 39 he straight goes on giving this atma gnana to uh, arjuna in different ways and there we initially saw in verse 12 he said there was never a time o oh arjuna where these kings were not there where you were not there where i was not there we all we come endlessly into this universe in different forms we might have changed our body that's all and then he says change of body is how he talks about the boyhood the youth the old age they are all attributes to the body they are like as you are wearing different clothes you change a clothes that doesn't mean that you have uh, you are no more there or you are not the same person you are the same person only you have changed your clothes that's all depending on the occasion now if you are going for a meeting you will be wearing a proper formal clothes you can't go with your night gown or your pajamas for a meeting if you are going to the gym you will not go with a three piece suit you will wear something which is comfortable for a gym or a yoga practice so likewise this body has kept on changing but that is never the death of the person so the soul continues to run and then in verse 14 where he now comes he takes him to another angle see there are so many angles which the lord wants to cover so he talks from different perspectives so you all should be able to understand that he is not continuing in the same manner he tries to jump to another track suddenly lord krishna so which we will be uh, i'll be explaining and we'll understand how that is happening So verse fourteen goes as follows of chapter two. Matra sparshas to kaunte ya, shitosh na suka dukha da, agama paino nitya, tante tikshasva Bharata. मात्रा स्पर्शस्तु कौंतेय मात्रा मीन्स मेजर सी यू आर दर्सिवर वी फील राइट वॉट वॉट इज हैपनिंग अराउंड एस वी फील विथ ऑल अर फाइव सेंसेस टच टेस्ट स्मेल हियर सी सो इस कौंतेय सन ऑफ कुंती डोंट गो गिव टू मच वैल्यू फॉर दिस objects around you why these are the same objects maybe it gives you a satisfaction it doesn't give another person another person satisfaction it could be something somebody relishes to eat but the other person may not even want to uh, smell it there could be something which even with you at a point of time it gave you so much happiness for a point of time it didn't give you happiness in the short span let's say you're eating one rasgulla then you had another one the third one fourth one fifth one sixth one seventh one then if somebody forces you have another one no half no a small bit no i can't or at different points of time with you like when you were a child we all have fought over toys with our uh, brothers and sisters and the kind of crying and howling we do is like we have lost everything in this world that was the level of crying one does as a child for a toy 
But now, has it got any value for you? Objects do not have a permanent status, Arjuna. They are anitya. Grow up, understand. So, not giving importance to these objects means he says that look, you may feel heat and cold, pleasure and pain. Now, heat and cold is at the level of the body. The experience of heat and cold is by the sense of touch at the level of the body. Pleasure and pain is at the level of the mind. So all these will keep coming to you. Sometimes your body is paining, sometimes it's aching, sometimes it gives you pleasure your, for your mind. Sometimes it's again, mind is also painful. Somebody says something wrong, it's painful. They're all objects. Don't give much importance to them. Your focus should be on that pure self, which is nitya, eternal. That is your consciousness within. And because of which you are alive, you are functioning. So that gets the highest priority. So now, yes, here, here if you see, he has only spoken about heat and cold, pain, pleasure and pain. Now as we go to the subsequent uh, uh, verses, he then brings in another aspect, which is like mana apamana, honor and dishonor which is at the level of the intellect. If somebody praises you, your intellect is affected. If somebody dishonors you, that is at the level of the intellect. So he gradually builds up, very scientifically done. He doesn't straight say all the points, no. He'll, he'll gradually say these things. So he says, these are there, don't give much importance to these objects. And you should be focused in your endeavor. There was once a father. He had a son who was in his early 20s. A business family. So son was taking care of the uh, family business. And the son was quite uh, enterprising and uh, outgoing. So he, apart from learning all the tactics of, his, uh, of the business from his father, he develops uh, a, a great keenness to expand the business. So from a small town, he moves to a city. And from there, he moves to a bigger city. And they were in the business of cotton. Okay, So they were initially procuring cotton and doing the ginning, we call it, you know, the separation of the seeds from uh, the cotton and you make them into bales and he moves to the next level from the bales he starts, so he says, I want to make uh, yarn and then he comes to a city and in the yarn he sets up a textile mill and then he says, now I want to do exports and then he's, he takes the permission of his father and he, he says, I want to um, move ahead in life, father is very happy. He says, okay, go ahead. So then he goes abroad to Manchester. He sets up a textile mill there after doing some exports. His father used to always tell him that situations in life, ups and downs are always there. Bear that in mind. And once it so happened that when he was abroad, his father was sick, so the, he, the son comes back flying. And in the last few moments before death, the father said, See, I think my time has come. I'm about to leave. My dear son, you have been a very good son to me. And what he does, he, he takes a, a ring from his finger and he puts it on to the son's finger. And he tells him, my dear son, unless and until you are dejected to the last moment, don't remove this ring from your body. 
from your finger. Okay, now this son is in extreme grief, but he understands what his father says, I should obey him. And he is wearing the uh, ring. Father passes away, he finishes the cremation, all the ritual, rituals, rites. And then he goes back to Manchester again and gets into business. Now in a busy life, it so happens that at, at one point of time, markets crash and the same time there is fire in the factory. He is extremely troubled. Now he is trying to manage his cash flows. He is not able to do that because all the contracts are getting honored, uh, dishonored because of the uh, markets crashing. In such scenario, he gets dejected and there was a situation that, okay, for the fire which has happened has burnt most of his stocks. They had not paid the premium, so he is not going to get anything from the insurance company. So with all this huge debt and a loss and not knowing how to move ahead, he goes to a, a river there to commit suicide. He stands up on the bridge and he is about to jump from the bridge. Suddenly it comes to his mind that my father had said not to remove this unless and until I come to the most dejected part of my life, a moment of my life. So then he says, yes, I have now come, I'm committing suicide, let me remove the ring. And he removes the ring to throw it first into the water and then he wanted to jump. As he removes the ring, he notices there is an inscription in the inner layer of the ring, even this will pass away. He sees that and Oh my God, my father is telling me something. Even this will pass away. I should hold on. He changes his mind. He comes back. And then he sees the insurance company, since he has paid ample, given ample business to them and paid huge premiums for the last almost 20 years, they say, sir, we know this is not willingly or not done this, there is an error. We condone the delay. There was just some three, four days delay, that's all. We condone the delay and we are settling your claim. Huge amount is coming from the insurance company now. And then the markets also take a turnaround for some reason or the other. Everything back to normal. Much better than before. So life is going to play with us with all these ups and downs from time to time, not to pay much heed to that. So here indirectly God is telling Krishna, uh, Krishna is telling Arjuna, see, these are objects, situations, circumstances. Don't pay much heed to it. Look at what you have to do in life. Focus on that. And then he moves forward. Then he says in verse number 15, Yam hina vyatayatyante purusham purusharshaba samadhukka sukam dhiram somrutatvaya kalpate somrutatvaya kalpate Meaning, what makes you eligible for immortality? Hey Arjuna, the one who is able to deal with pleasure and pain alike, that can only take you to immortality. Reason being, that is, mind is that which is coming between you and God. That mind, that ego, that's all. Otherwise, everything is divine. We are nothing but God's creation only. Just that we have got that mind in us, we are behaving like a, a jiva. 
So he says, this sorrow and happiness is also temporary. Practice to bear sorrow and happiness equally. He is again gearing him up over there. See, we may say, you know, no, no, I am fine. Uh, any amount of um, pleasure or happiness I'm, I can bear. I don't mind. But here he says, bear sorrow and happiness equally. I'll tell you one thing here. We learnt about the mental distancing where under the pancha koshas you are moving away from your entire five koshas. We did that exercise. Today we'll do the uh, meditation also. We'll continue on that for, um, for quite some days. So here you have to actually distance your mind from yourself. You are able to see, an, anything you see is an object, we are clear about it. So you are able to see your mind, isn't it? Now if I tell you, uh, can you tell me what is 8 into 5? If I ask you, suddenly with open eyes or closed eyes, you'll work out, you'll say, okay, 8 into 5 equals 40. You get that image in your mind, isn't it? So which means you are able to see your mind. So what you see is not you. It is different because it's an object. So here he says that you have to practice this. And when it comes to my personal experience, when you have something which is sad, okay, not, not pleasant, let's call it that way. To distance your mind is difficult actually. So what I normally do is I start distancing when there is some pleasant news or happiness. I, you become an observer. You distance your mind and yourself as a Sakshi, as a witness, and you see. If you start practicing when the mind is happy, then eventually you can do the same thing when the mind is unhappy also. So he says, you have to, you should not torment at these things. Treat them alike, pleasure and pain. They are going to keep coming. And we should always try to have and keep a higher goal. Yes, when there is pain, like for example, if somebody goes to the gym, he wants to build, build his body. So there is pain. What is his aim now? I want to have a good physique. So for a good physique, I need to take some pain. And you have set up a higher goal for yourself. So as they say, you know, if attitude is right, it can make a person. And if attitude is wrong, it can break a person. So such situations should not allow you to, to be broken down. This is a true story of uh, the Osho Foundation uh, founder, Sri Rajneesh. He mentions that he comes from a, a village, a very poor family. Father is hardly able to meet their, uh, both ends. With great difficulty, after almost 30-35 years of savings, his father manages to build a house. That too in the outskirts of a village, a small house. That's like house meaning it's not with too many rooms and things like that. Just a square house. That's it. One room house. That too out of mud. Now here he says what happened? We, the house was being constructed. My father, whatever he knew, he was able to, with that knowledge and with some assistance here and there, he constructed the house. And they were about to shift into the house where it was almost complete, getting completed. It collapses. The entire house collapses. Now, he says, my father, the next day, he was carrying a box of sweets and distributing to the entire villagers, his friends, relatives, the entire village. 
everybody was very sad that his house collapsed nice person they thought you know probably he must have lost his mind and when they ask him why are you doing this it's okay he says i'm happy if it was another week my entire family would have been inside the house and we would have all got buried in the house which would have fallen on us so this is the kind of an attitude whatever happens you should look for something positive over there situations come you can't avoid in one of the ramkrishna mats in belur there was a young monk this is a true story again once what happens a situation arises and this monk is blamed for doing something extremely wrong which is against the rules of the ashram now everybody is cursing him scolding him giving stern looks now this young monk says i have not done that i have not done that but nobody is ready to listen a poor fellow he can't control what he does is he was close to one of the very senior monks who was almost in his 90s and very sick so he goes to the uh, hospital the ashram hospital and he weeps in front of him see this is what has happened i have not done that thing i have not done what they are blaming me for now this old swami ji he holds him by the collar and pulls him near him because he cannot get up and he is not able to hear him also properly but he understood what he is trying to say he tells him in his ears young man now there is nobody between you and god go make the best do your sadhana to the fullest make the best here at least you will have so many duties being in the ashram you will have to take care of the sometimes the kitchen sometimes the temple sometimes the ashram sometimes the cleaning there you will have nothing now there is nobody between you and god go so this are these are what we call as positive attitudes so lord krishna is trying to say that pain and pleasure are alike don't torment the one who is able to deal with this kind of a situation without being affected he becomes eligible for immortality not that he attains immortality he becomes eligible so from here the eligibility criteria starts okay now the next verse verse number 16 this again talks of the highest truth in the entire bhagavad gita now that you will have a background nothing to worry i'll briefly touch base on this and then we'll all sit for meditation and tomorrow i'll take up this particular uh, verse in detail you all would like to repeat after me i'll repeat uh, i'll say um in bits and pieces okay let's uh, please repeat na sato vidyate bhavah na bhavo vidyate satah ubhayo rapi drushtontah ವನಯೋಸ್ತದರ್ಶಿ ವನಯೋಸ್ತದರ್ಶಿ ಹರಿ ಸೇಸ್ ದಿ ಅನ್ರಿಯಲ್ ದಿ ಡೈರೆಕ್ಟ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ let's first understand that and then go to the intrinsic and the deeper meaning of it 
the unreal what you see in this world that has got no existence and the real is never out of existence in other words it never ceases to be but it is never out of existence the one who knows what is real and what is unreal they are considered to be the persons who can see the truth see the supreme truth tvanayo tattva darshi bihi they only can see the truth here again is talking of eligibility factor only you should be first able to distinguish what is truth what is untruth in terms in other mean, in other words what is permanent and what is impermanent and this faculty of a human being is known as viveka shakti viveka shakti means the person who can discriminate what is right what is wrong what is lower what is higher what is good what is bad what is permanent what is impermanent what gives me uh, pleasure what gives me pain 